I'm your host, Aaron Heath. I take a moment and thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to episode number 52 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. You can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 052. The gun of the show for this episode is the Howa 1500 Axiom Combo. Now, the gun that I am going to be talking about in particular is no longer in production in this kit. However, mine is chambered in the 270 Winchester, a cartridge known for its sharp recall. It's based off the 30-06, so that's not really a surprise. However, this Howa 1500 that was part of this combination package is equipped with the Axiom stock. And it was too good of a deal in my favorite caliber for me to pass up. So I bought it, and to be perfectly honest, I have never zeroed this rifle myself. After getting it from the dealer, me and him went to the range and he fired it first. Three clicks of adjustment by him, and it was my turn to fire. I fired it, and the rifle was dead on. Now the reason he fired it first is because we made a deal where he would sell it to me, because he actually ordered it for himself, but when he called it in, he quoted the wrong number, resulting in the wrong caliber. And our agreement was, if I let him shoot it first, he'd go ahead and sell it to me right then, and then after he fired it, he'd quickly go back to work in time to order the one he wanted, if he liked how it felt. Now, like I said, I fired the second shot, I plugged the target, I mean, it was dead on. And after that, I fell in love with this gun. Now, this particular combo package includes a Nico Sterling Night Eater Scope mounted on a Howa 1500 Action that rests in the very odd-looking Axiom stock from Blackhawk. The Night Eater Scope does an admirable job when it comes to light gathering, and it works very well in low-light conditions. The Howa 1500 Action is a time-proven design that can more than handle the 270 Winchester cartridge that this particular rifle is chambered in. Now, the Axiom stock is what makes this package interesting. Designed to minimize the felt recoil and limit the overall discomfort many people associate when firing certain cartridges, this stock looks odd, especially on a bolt action, to say the least. Now, this stock does feature a true pistol grip, kind of like an AR-15, and it has an M4-like adjustable shoulder stock. Both are features that look out of place on this particular package, on this particular rifle. Now, I'd also like to point out that the Axiom stock also free floats the barrel. Now, the model for this one is the Howa 1500 Axiom Combo. It's chambered in the 270 Winchester. It is a bolt-action firearm, so it's a single shot, work the bolt, fire a shot, work the bolt. I believe the magazine has a capacity of four. There are no sights on it, but it, in this particular case, it came with a Nico Sterling Night Eater 3 to 10 by 42 Materials that it's made out of, well, the stock is obviously polymer. It's got a steel action, and the bolt and barrel are also steel. In regards to the MSRP, with this one no longer in production, I didn't really look one up. However, let me say that short-action cartridges are available in the same combo. And I believe they also have uh, some camo pattern on the uh, combos available too. Now with that said, let me run the audio clip that tells you how to get the show. And after that, we're going to come back with some interesting information. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Myro Player, YouTube, the website, and of course, in your favorite app using the RSS feed on the website. With all those options, there is no excuse for not subscribing. Links to all these can be found on every page of the website. Now we do have a little bit of a reciprocity update. Texas and the great state of Ohio now recognize each other's concealed handgun license. Now, the reason I say the great state of Ohio, before it recognized the Texas license, it wasn't really a great state. However, now that both states have reciprocity with each other, Ohio joins the ranks of great states such as Texas. I do have a couple of show news and announcement pieces. On April 2nd of 2015, episode 53 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast will be recorded live. That will be the Thursday that this podcast, or the, the Thursday of the week that this podcast is released. Now, you can be part of this episode. All you got to do if you want to be a participant in this podcast is to call 866-825-5301 and be ready to talk. We'll bring you in. It's going to be a call-in show. Now, those of you who don't know, we we rarely do call-in shows as part of this podcast. In fact, we haven't done one since I rebranded the show. However, if you want to listen to it, 
or participate in the chat, just go to gunrightsintexas.com slash live. I do have another announcement, but that's going to be part of the topic. Now, with that said, I'm going to go ahead and run the social media clip, and then I'll be back and we'll actually hit the topic with the other announcement. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast has a social media presence. You can like it on Facebook, you can follow it on Twitter, you can circle it on Google+, and you can follow it on Instagram. With all those options, let's get social. I was recently a guest on the recording of a history podcast called Come and Take It. The podcast was an excellent experience, I will say that. And it let me see how different podcasters do different things. I personally like to record my podcast in one take. Podcast. Okay, I am seriously uh, slurring my speech. Maybe, maybe I need to cool down before I record a podcast in the future. I've been outside mowing and my sinuses are starting to plug up and I, I can feel that I got a little too hot out there. I'm drinking lots of liquids and mostly water. But anyways, back to topic. As I was saying, I like to record my podcast in one take, warts and all with a very minimal, if any, editing done in the process. Now, while I'm doing that, I tend to follow a very rough outline that, more often than not, gets ignored. Come and Take It is actually a far more polished product that uses a more scripted format, and it's, well, when I say a scripted format, let me say there's a scripted portion, and then there is a discussion portion. And it's a great, it's a great format that results in a very polished product with a very interesting, uh, well, It's a very interesting show. Now, while it presents a cleaner and better product, I tend to like my more chaotic and seemingly random method because it's a better fit for myself. I will also say that I believe that that episode of Come and Take It will be episode number 81, and it should release the day after this episode that I'm recording right now. If you want to go and listen to it, go to brainstaple.com and check out the podcast, Come and Take It. Now, while I was preparing for being a guest on that show, I researched the history behind Texas gun laws. I discovered that one particular bill ended open and concealed carry back in 1871. That bill was House Bill 115 by a Frederick Edward Grothus. Grothus or something like that. I know I mispronounced his name, but I don't really care. Now, this was in the 12th regular session of the Texas legislature. Unable to find the exact bill, I turned to the Texas CHL form and asked for some help, and boy, did those guys ever come through, especially Mountain Thunder 2. Now, he spells his uh, handle on the form M-T-N-T-H-U-N-D-R-2, no E. Now, he found the two resources I'm going to be referencing for this episode. I found a lot of this information elsewhere, but these two resources touch on everything I wanted to talk about, so... This episode is as much a tribute to Come and Take It as it is a thank you to Mountain Thunder 2 for going through all going through and finding these things. Also, it's a thank you and a tribute to the Texas CHL Forum for helping me research it. Now, I'm going to include some links in the show notes to a couple of resources. One will be referred to as the Haltex document, and the other will be a book that's available for free from Google in PDF format. It's a scan of and I'm trying to remember the name of it, something like a digest of the laws of Texas containing the laws in force and the repeal laws on which rights rest from 1754 to 1874. I think there, I, I want to say that's a little bit long of a title, but then again, it could be the actual title. But that's what I got down in my show notes is the title of the book. Well, let's move on and give you some history on gun rights in Texas. And my... Google document has once again changed the dates that I was looking at. In 1868, a Reconstruction Convention was called in Texas under the Federal Reconstruction Acts in order to ratify the 14th Amendment and adopt a new constitution that was consistent with it. This convention met in Austin between June and December with an 1867 Attorney General's report appended to the journal about pretended laws of 1866 against freedom. Chapter 92, page 90, points out that a law made it illegal to carry firearms on an enclosed, or on enclosed land without the consent of the landowner. These pretend laws, which were passed to make possible the restoration of slavery through a modified system of peonage. Well, let me go back and explain this. Basically, right after 
the South surrendered in the Civil War, the state legislature passed a whole bunch of laws that were intended to recreate slavery without the name. You know, essentially, the very first gun control efforts in Texas were racist, and therefore, by modern standards, and even standards that were starting to be developed back then, very unacceptable. After the new state constitution was passed and a new legislator or legislature was in office, things changed for the worst. That's right. Now, at the end of that journal, a related attorney general's opinion stated that gun control was, and I'm going to quote, a cunningly devised system planned to prevent equality before the law and for restoration of African slavery in a modified form, in fact, though not in name, end of quote. Now, during the convention, an amendment to the state constitution was proposed that would have read, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the safety of a free state, every citizen shall have the right to keep and bear arms for the common defense. Nevertheless, this article shall not be construed as giving any countenance to the evil practice of carrying private or concealed weapons about the person. But the legislative and municipal authorities within this state are fully authorized to make such laws and ordinances as shall tend to abolish a practice so prolific uh, with or of strife and bloodshed. End of quote. That amendment, although not adopted, did indicate the goal of these or the the goal of those writing the new constitution was to regulate the carrying of arms. More more specifically, the carrying of concealed arms, not the ownership of them. Now, the vast majority of what I just talked about comes from the Hall text document, pages 19 and 20. Now, in August of 1870, the legislature that was elected shortly after, uh, after the new constitution was adopted passed a law titled An Act Regulating the Right to Keep and Bear Arms, which made it illegal to go into any church or religious assembly, schoolroom, or other place where persons are assembled for educational, literary, or scientific purposes, or any ballroom, social party, or social gathering comprised of, or composed of ladies and gentlemen, or any election precinct on the day or days of any election where any portion of the people of this state are collected to vote at any election, or any other or to any other place where people may be assembled to muster or perform other public duty, or any other public assembly. Now let's stop there and go back to the muster or perform other public duty. Essentially, the militia was expected to muster when called. And that's what this is saying you cannot bear arms to. That does not really make too much sense. But going back, we're going to touch on this, but the... Oh, man. You know what? Just keep in mind the part that says, or any election precinct on the day or days of an election or of any election where any portion of the people of this state are collected to vote at any election. Very convoluted language, but remember that because we're going to come back to it and that's going to be something to remember because it plays an important role later. Now, a violation of this law was a misdemeanor with a penalty not with a penalty of fine not less than $50 or more than $500. There were exceptions for areas subject to Indian depredations and people whose duty required them to keep and bear arms on such occasions in discharge of duties imposed by law meaning military and law enforcement. Now, that law became what is known today as Texas Penal Code Section 4603. According to the Haltex document, the elections of 1869 were subject to massive fraud and force. And that's where the part I asked you to keep in mind comes back into play about the uh, prohibition on arms at any election precinct. After the elections, Governor E.J. Davis assumed extraordinary powers that were just short of those assumed by warlords and god kings of ancient of ancient times. The powers he assumed included the powers to make arrests, blah, 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 tongue-tied, suspend the writ of habeas corpus, and declare martial law. The Haltex document notes that legislators ran the risk of being arrested if they opposed his policies, which makes the passage of the 1870 Act regulating the right to keep and bear arms obviously his doing, as well as the 1871 Act regulating the keeping and bearing of deadly weapons which we're going to come to next. In April of 1871, the Texas legislature passed a law entitled An Act Regulating and Keeping An Act Regulating the Keeping and Bearing of Deadly Weapons. Now this was House Bill 115 
as it was sponsored by Grothus, or Grothus, or whatever his name was, the one that I'm seriously mispronouncing. It would also become what we know today as Texas Penal Code Section 4602. The 1871 form of this law was very draconian, and it set the trend for gun control across the country. It would not be until 1995 before ordinary citizens could carry a handgun for self-defense. And then they could only carry it with a license, and it had to be concealed. In 2015, the legislature is looking to chip away at some more of this draconian law, but let's look at what the original did before we consider what may be undone. This law made it illegal for any person to carry on or about their person, saddle, or saddlebag, any pistol, dirk, dagger, slung shot, and I'm going to have to go into, I'm going to have to explain what that is at some later date, sword cane, spear, brass knuckles, or bowie knife or any other knife made or sold for the purpose of offense or defense. Think about that. You could not have a knife sold or made for the purpose of defensive use. That wouldn't jive too well with the Heller decision, or at least I don't think it would, but I'm not an attorney, and and I do have to admit that the constitutional courts, known as the Supreme Court, has not ruled on knives, just firearms. No, the law did provide a few exceptions, such as if someone had reasonable grounds for fearing an unlawful attack on their person, and that such ground of attack would have been immediate and pressing. In other words, somebody saying, I'm going to kill you, would not be grounds for bringing a weapon. Somebody screaming, I'm going to kill you, and waving a gun, and then leaving, well, that wouldn't be grounds either. Now, somebody saying, I'm going to kill you on Tuesday, May 9th, at 5 p.m., Wherever you're at might be grounds, but then again, it may not. It was all subject to interpretation. Another exception to the law was anyone having or carrying the same weapon or carrying a weapon that's listed in here on or about their purpose for the lawful defense of the state as a militiaman in actual service. In other words, if if you're in the militia and you were called up to defend the state, you could have one of these weapons that were declared illegal if it was actually for the service that you were called up for. Now, a third exception was for a peace officer or policeman. Now, you go through some more of the bill, and then some additional exceptions come up. And these additional exceptions include keeping and bearing arms on one's own premises or at one's place of business. There was an exception for sheriffs, revenue officers, and other civil officers while in the discharge of their civil duties. And finally, there was an exception for those who were traveling with the arms that were prohibited in their baggage. Now, a violation of this law was a misdemeanor with a penalty that was no no less than $25 and no more than $100. Included in that was forfeiture of all weapons found on or about the person and imprisonment in the county jail for no more than 60 days after the first offense. Now, this was a pretty draconian law, especially when you consider it was the first law where people actually lost the right to keep or not to keep but to bear arms out in public i mean you had some cities and there may have been one or two in texas but i haven't been able to find any documentation of them that would require people to check their firearms when they enter town but even then that wasn't to the level that this was this was actually a very draconian law that was shoved down the state's throat by well a would-be dictator think about that When somebody says that we are oppressed now because the government has so much authority and they're doing so many things, keep in mind, we have not seen anything where legislators were getting arrested in order to get uh, pet bills passed. And then there's also the fact that in modern days, we actually threaten to arrest legislators so that they can be brought home in order to be able to vote. Big difference in the times. Back then... It was, vote my way or you will be arrested. Now it's, show up and vote or you will be arrested. Now, people who don't know what I'm talking about, a few years ago, the legislature had a significant portion of it run away to Oklahoma to avoid having enough people for le- for the state to do its business. Now, the governor, he didn't quite appreciate that. And there were threats made about having them arrested and brought back so that they could do their duties. Nothing ever came of it because, well, things were settled and the business went on its way. But it shows that there's a big difference between now and then. And it makes you wonder, it really makes you wonder what kind of powers 
would some of these uh, modern politicians enjoy that our governor back in ni- or back in 1868 gave himself? It's a scary thought. He had massive fraud enforced at the le- at the elections, and you never can tell if people show up and try to intimidate voters, or they're showing up keeping voters away. Or maybe they just showed up and said, okay, you want to vote this way, and if I see you vote wrong, I'm going to shoot you. Or if the uh, ballot boxes were replaced with ballot boxes that contained more votes for the guy that wanted to win the most. It was it was a very bad time. And this is the kind of thing that every time somebody says, we need a revolution because things are out of control. Keep in mind, this was the results of a revolution. This was not, okay, we're going to, we're going to have a revolution because things are bad. No, it was things are bad because we just had a revolution. You had a near warlord, a tyrant, a near dictator in power arresting people for doing what they were supposed to be doing just because what they thought did not agree with what he thought. Anyhow, I think that's enough on the history aspect of it. I'm going to run the contact promo or the contact audio clip. And after that, I am going to come back, hit the news. We'll run the, we'll actually run the sign off music. And after that, we'll have a legislative update, a very brief one because my headache's getting worse. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com. Or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409-292-6736. And we're back for the news segment. Now, we're going to have... I did not get the news for Friday because... That would have required more time that I did not have. So all the news that I'm actually going to cover for this week is from earlier in the week. We're going to have three or four stories in the politics category, and we'll call it good. And I need to pull up the news segment. Our first story comes from Liberty Hill, where Police Chief Randy Williams and Judith Baker, who is the owner of a Texas Girls Guns, which is a business that offers firearms and training, Well, these two are lamenting the possible passage of open carry. They offer the possibility that someone may take an openly carried firearm, among other common excuses used to attack open carry. Now, with that in mind, I have to offer up the question to those who oppose open carry for the reasons in the article. Can you please point out to me where this has been a problem in the other states, and there's something like 44 of them, that have some form of open carry? Please point this out for me. I need facts, not emotions. Now, we have an article with the headline, Most Locals Unfazed by the Possible Passage of Open Carry and Campus Carry Bills by Texas Lawmakers. Now, that that uh, headline pretty much says it all. Now, the article does mention the story behind the ban on handgun carry in Texas, and it touches on the process the bills have to go through. It's a good story to offset the first one. And then we have a story where State Senator Donna Campbell is covered in this article about her bill, SB 273, which is intended to prevent political subdivisions of the state from improperly posting signs preventing concealed carry that the particular that any of these particular uh, political subdivisions have no authority to post. Essentially, imagine if a city or a county decided, we're going to post the park with a 30-06 sign to keep concealed carry out of our park because we don't want those dirty, nasty guns in our park. Well this bill would actually give some teeth to the preemption law that basically tells the counties and the cities, hey, you can't do that. And we have one more story where the new Black Panther Party has called for the killing of police by or at South by Southwest. Not to be out derp, some open carry advocates threatened the Black Panther Party back. <laughs> yep. And here's what's said. C.J. Grisham and Justin Delosh may feel a need to respond with statements like these. However, I should pull it up and read what was posted on Facebook. It was a Facebook post by C.J. Grisham with Justin Delosh at the bottom of it. I'm not much of a Facebook user. I tend to tend not to really use it. However, let me say that when you make a statement 
where you're essentially threatening somebody back for threatening, say, the police or anybody, it only hurts our cause. It hurts our efforts, and it gives the gun banners something to point to when they say we are a crazy fringe group, and it kind of confirms what the media tries to paint us as, even though it's not true. So for Justin Delosh or Delosh or how you pronounce his name and C.J. Grisham, please quit helping us on that. Really, we mean it. Now with that said, I would like to thank everybody at the Texas CHL Forum, especially Mountain Thunder 2, for finding the materials that I used in this episode. I would also like to thank the NRA, the TSRA, and all the other groups that are actually being polite and cooperative and working with the legislature instead of kind of threatening them or showing their ass to the legislature. And yes, Open Carry Tarrant County, I'm looking at you with that one. Please, cover up Corey Watkins. It's not nice to show things like that in public, okay? I would also like to thank the listeners for listening to this episode and sending in suggestions. And I would like to thank the folks over at Come and Take It, the podcast. Not the gun rights group, but the podcast that you can download at brainstaple.com. I would like to thank them for inviting me on as a guest for their sh- uh, for their show and basically for inspiring this episode. Later, I may update the show notes on this episode so that it points to the link on Come and Take It or to the Come and Take It episode that I, that I am a guest on. However, it's time for the sign-off music, and immediately afterwards, I'll come back and give you a quick legislative update. With that said, if I don't hear you after the music, if you don't, if you stop it at the music, please stay safe and carry responsibly. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly. We're back for the Texas legislative update, and this is going to be a short episode simply because, well, my sinuses are killing me. My head is hurting from the sinus head from the sinuses, and I want to get this over with. Enough talking about that, and time to start talking about the legislative update. House Bill 910 has been reported favorably and is out of the committee and now goes to the calendars committee, which means it'll get scheduled for a vote on the floor, hopefully sometime soon. It could die in the calendars committee by never being assigned a time, but I think with all the pressure that is being put on everybody, I think we're going to see this bill go for a vote. The good news is that if it, if things work out just right, SB 17 will get substituted for its spot for house bill 910 spot in order to expedite getting SB 17 voted on. And then we can get everything to the governor's desk and go from there. Now, a little bit ago, we did an episode on House Bill 2918, and it appears that this book, blah, 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 tongue-tied again, it appears that this bill has been pulled by the author. The First Amendment Desecration Act is no longer a threat, it would appear. We will keep an eye out for to see if this bill is somehow revived or if there's anything else similar to it. Now, with that said... That's the end of our Texas legislative update, so please stay safe and carry responsibly.